Ecology is the way living beings interact with one another and to their physical surroundings. This concept can also be a make or break factor of what makes a video game feel alive. And in my opinion, the Monster Hunter series, and particularly Monster Hunter World, is a standout example of this. Let's explore why. Hi, my name is Kiki Beth, and I studied ecology in college and graduate school. Ecology can be the relationship between predator and prey, or the cycling of key nutrients and energy throughout food webs, or the specialization of an animal's traits to match its habitat, or how animals claim territory or reproduce, and how humans interact with all those things. And what you quickly learn as a student of this field is that all these different types of interactions are affecting one another at the same time. Time. Everything is interconnected. It gets real complex really fast, like there's a lot of math involved. But anyway, Monster Hunter illustrates this real world concept in a fantasy world through its monsters, who the player is tasked with fighting, either to capture or more often to slay. And I'll get a bit more into the story within the games later on. Monster Hunter World's director, Yuya Tokura, said, the fields in Monster Hunter World include features that are a lot more fantasy-like than previous games. We added a realistic ecosystem to balance that, and I believe an ecosystem is not complete without creatures that feel alive. And they delivered! Monster Hunter World was my first foray into the series, so please excuse any mistakes, I am a new fan, I've only played World and Rise so far. But when I was first introduced, I was just blown away by the detail and realism of these monsters. Take Kuluyaku, for example. When you first see this bird-like monster, it's usually carrying a rock or an egg. Follow it around and you may get to see the process of it stealing an egg from another monster's nest and eating it. Attack it and you'll see it dig up a similarly sized rock to defend itself with. Just by observing and interacting with this monster, you realize that, much like a real animal, it has adapted to its surrounding environment. A rocky forest or desert with plenty of coexisting species that lay nutritious eggs. So it's adapted its behaviors to fit this environment, and its body has adapted to have these big grabby claws that are perfectly suited to holding objects of that size. This is so intuitive that a player can figure that out just by watching it. This is an example of the classic storytelling device, Show Don't Tell. Unlike a game such as Pokemon, where the ecology details are usually found in the Pokédex and not usually expressed in the game itself, with Monster Hunter you naturally learn the ecology just by playing. and grow to understand it without necessarily having to look anything up. Although the game does have its own version of a Pokédex as well, so it's kind of the best of both worlds. Each monster is carefully and intricately designed, both in appearance and in behavior. Every detail has a reason. Baroth is a monster that favors muddy habitat in the desert, and it covers itself in mud for defense, camouflage, and likely to keep cool and moist while the sun is beating down. It's got a really thick, solid head which it uses to charge at enemies, including you, as well as to break open ant mounds for feeding. So the design features of these monsters make sense in multiple contexts. The head also has a bunch of nostrils on top so that it can breathe easily when submerged in the mud, something you're likely to witness while fighting it. Puke Puke fights with poison, so it's designed with this bulging chin and tail that stores up poisonous fluids and gas, and it can be seen feeding on poisonous plants in the forest. Anjanath has this pronounced nasal crest and an excellent sense of smell to go along with it, so it can sniff you out and attack you even if you're hiding. Yeah, I found that out the hard way. Toby Kadachi fights with electricity so it's very furry and rubs up against trees in the surrounding forest to build up static charge. All these little design details make the creatures more believable and make them feel more alive. And this is woven into the main challenge of gameplay, which is learning all of these behaviors, you know, the patterns and how it moves and how it attacks, the specific adaptations that they have so that you can attack and survive more effectively. The art book talks about how each early game monster is meant to teach the player something new. So in its most basic sense, Baroth is a tutorial on how to dodge a straightforward charge attack and then follow up. But it doesn't feel like a tutorial, it's another case of show don't tell. And the care that was clearly put into the design of this monster makes it just as immersive and believable and thrilling as any other battle. 
So yeah, there's clearly a lot of detail in each monster's design and behavior, but the game doesn't even just stop there. Like, beyond explaining the way a monster chooses to attack you, monsters' behaviors sometimes don't even directly involve the player, but they still play a role in the battle. Let me explain. The most obvious example is Turf Wars. These are intense spectacles in which two monsters fight one another. The interaction is unique to the individual monster types, really adding to the depth of the game. And these Turf Wars really opened my eyes to the fact that this isn't just me versus monster, like other monsters can attack each other. I don't even have to be around for them to fight. Like, wow, the world really doesn't revolve around me. Imagine! But obviously this does affect your quest indirectly. The monsters will take damage, making them easier to defeat, and one might run away to a different part of the map, and in Rise you'll even be able to ride one. Another example is eating, like I mentioned with Kulu eating the eggs and Baroth eating ants, but you'll also see monsters eating other monsters, like the smaller herbivorous monsters that live in the ecosystem, and <laughs> the circle of life is happening, or you'll see them eat plants. Yes, this big guy is an herbivore. It's kind of precious. This has the literal gameplay effect of enemies recovering stamina, but it's presented in a way that's subtle and makes sense within this living world. And again, you don't even need to be there for this to be happening. Monsters also need to sleep every once in a while, especially when they've exerted a lot of energy. It makes them very vulnerable for you to attack, but it also just makes them feel like a real creature that needs a nap often in a specific cozy nest spot on the map. Feeding behavior, competition for territory, and finding shelter are all big parts of real-world ecology, and giving these monsters a life outside of being hunted by you adds to that realism. It also makes me feel really bad hunting them. More on that later. These interactions may affect the player, but they don't require the player's input to happen. These are the interactions that make you feel like you're entering a true living ecosystem, and that you, dear player, are not the center of it. You're not the reason these interactions happen. It's a nice sense of humbleness that I think is very appropriate when it comes to like appreciating the environment in real life. Here's a few more details that really impressed me and made me feel like the game was going above and beyond. When you kill a monster, scavengers like revultures will show up to eat the carcass. You can use one monster to lure another out, like this Noyos, whose loud noises bring Diablos to the sand's surface. Super epic, by the way. While Palumu and Rufinos are feeding on these floating eggs in the coral highlands, Titsi Yaku shows up to hunt Rufinos by stunning it with light. I love the complex web of interactions here. Even the environments themselves are interconnected, not physically, but narratively. World's Rotten Veil vale map is full of dead and decaying life from the coral highlands above it. And the monsters that live there tend to be scavengers and need to be adapted to survive in a habitat that's filled with poisonous gas released by the bacteria decomposing those rotting carcasses. What an interesting idea! I appreciate this whole area focused on decomposition because it's an often forgotten but really important part of ecological food webs. I'm a little biased because I did research decomposition back in the day. When I first saw all this realism in Monster Hunter, there was definitely a part of me that was like, maybe I don't want to kill these realistic creatures. I love animals. It honestly makes me sad to see them slowly weakening, bleeding, becoming broken and battered, and then my hunter just mercilessly wails away at them and uses their body parts to make weapons and armor. What am I doing? <laughs> But the story, at least in World, provides some justification for this behavior, which has some real-world parallels. Your character is a part of a research commission filled with various scholars looking to study the ecosystem and protect it from these disaster-causing beings known as Elder Dragons. And you happen to be one of the hunters in the group, given tasks like culling overpopulated or invasive monsters that are wreaking havoc to the ecosystem, killing or capturing capturing a monster for the purpose of researching it and better understanding it, and just generally maintaining and restoring ecological balance. There's definitely some legitimate merit to these types of tasks. 
Quick content warning, I'm about to lightly touch on the subject of real life hunting. If you don't want to hear about animals being harmed, skip to the timestamp on screen. I was a student scientist at an ecological research institute in real life, and we did collaborate with local hunters to help manage the out of control deer population in the area, which is throwing off the balance of the ecosystem. Usually the need for responsible controlled hunting is created by human activities that give certain species an artificial advantage or disadvantage that's throwing things off. In the case of deer, planting lots of turf grass and building lots of roads and development creates these sort of edge habitats that deer love while their predators don't. Deer are not inherently bad as a species, but when overpopulated, out of control, they harm plant populations unsustainably and contribute to the spread of Lyme disease. And conveniently for the Institute's research, hunters could then donate the dead deer to be studied for how many Lyme spreading ticks they're carrying, or used as bait to study scavengers like vultures and big cats. I've also worked a lot with dead sea creature specimens that scientists collected for the purpose of documenting what species are out there. I didn't choose to constantly work with dead animals, but that's a lot of what I did as a researcher, to be honest. And this is pretty similar to the types of quests that you get in Monster Hunter World. You know, you're not just slaying these poor little monsters for the fun of it, you're helping the ecosystem by reducing the population to healthy, manageable, sustainable levels, or helping to further our understanding of the natural world. Another real-world analog is invasive species. Again, there's nothing inherently wrong with a lionfish. They're beautiful and fascinating animals that I'm glad exist in this world, but they're wreaking so much havoc in ocean ecosystems that they were never meant to enter, to the point that killing them is now like a highly desired skill along the Atlantic coast. Like there's lionfish hunting competitions, kill as many as you can. And it can feel kind of sad and heartless to an animal lover like me, but it makes sense in the grand scope of ecology. Now the quests in Monster Hunter aren't focused on counteracting any human-caused problems, but they are focused on restoring balance to an ecosystem that's been disrupted by an outside force. In this case, it's the big boss Elder Dragons. I do think there's an interesting discussion to be had about how well are the humans balancing interfering with nature versus protecting it, especially since in real life disturbances are not always a bad thing. But that's a bit outside the scope of this particular video, but let me know if you'd like to hear me expand on that in the future. All of that being said though, obviously this is just a video game and a lot of the appeal is slaying lots of monsters to make those cool armor sets, and plenty of the quests are just your standard fantasy conflict, you know, this annoying monster is after me, it's gonna eat my friends, go fight it. And honestly, that's fine too, you know, I don't think everything has to reflect reality, I just think it's neat that sometimes there's these fun parallels to real life science. Monster Hunter is definitely a series where you can keep digging deeper and deeper and there's no shortage of details to find. When I bought this Monster Hunter World art book, I was so impressed to learn like not just the ecology details that you kind of already learn by playing the game, but also like the backstory behind those details and like even more obscure things that I just never would have thought of, but that still make sense within the context of the game. Like how the reason that Anjanath is kind of pink is because it has this semi-translucent skin so that you can see the color of its blood underneath and its retractable membranes help it to regulate its body temperature as do its feathers and its sunbathing behavior and the membranes also help it communicate with others of its kind and now we're at the point where none of these details have a gameplay purpose like eating or fighting it's just more and more layers of detail for the players to discover and enjoy and learn about their favorite monsters and all the details make sense and don't feel tacked on. It's obvious that the developers had a clear vision from the very start for each of these monsters. So much work was put into fleshing it out and making it all make sense. It's really impressive. This quote from executive director Kaname Fujioka sums it up really well. I truly believe Monster Hunter World is about the details. We focused on the smallest details from single pebbles to bugs and carefully designed them and placed them in the world. And each of those small details interacts with one another. These details pile up on each other, adding depth to the game, and help you get absorbed into the gameplay. 
that's definitely been true for me. I'm happy to be a new fan of the series and looking forward to Monster Hunter Rise, Sunbreak, and wherever the series goes next. Do you have a favorite monster or obscure detail in a Monster Hunter game? Or are there any other games with impressive ecology that you think I should check out? If so, please let me know in the comments. I would love to learn from you. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye. If I were to review this book, I'd give it a 10 out of 10 for content and a 0 out of 10 for construction. Like, there are entire pages falling out of this thing. Like, not my fault. They just are not well attached to the spine. And that's a bummer. <laughs> it's a real bummer and it only came in soft cover. So, yeah, look at this. It's just, it's not good. It's not good. So, I do recommend it. It's very cool. So much information. So much information. More information than I could possibly read. Well, yeah, I'm getting there. I'm reading through it little by little. But, uh, oh, and the, the, the artwork is gorgeous. It's got, like, all the weapons and stuff. I found the crab page, you guys. It's also the wiggler page. So that's the best page in the book, obviously.